Okay, so chapter nine, we're going to go over the cost of production. And this will play a part in understanding the behavior of firms. Okay, so economic costs are payments that must be made to obtain and retain services of a resource. Explicit costs do not require an outlay of cash. If there's something that you can pay for with cash, then it is an explicit cost. So um, if I was a carpenter, then an explicit cost, for example, would be wood, uh, nails, and also, you know, the tools that I will need in order to make a table, for example. Um, implicit costs, okay, these do not require a cash outlay. Um, it is the opportunity cost of using your own resources or an opportunity cost of deciding to produce one good instead of another good. So for example, if I were to quit my job uh, to become a carpenter, okay, then the opportunity cost of that is the salary I give up being a teacher, for example. So that does not require an outlay of cash, but however, um, it is a cost nonetheless associated with me deciding to change careers. Okay. Or let's say I'm trying to decide, you know, between being a carpenter or owning my own bakery. And let's say I made $80,000 as a carpenter. You know, this is, you know, including my sales and also the cost of my resources. But what I should also include is what I would have made had I decided instead to open up my own bakery. Let's say the profit of the bakery is 30, would have been $30,000, you know, estimated. Then that is called a normal profit and it is included in implicit costs. Okay, so accounting profit is total revenue minus explicit costs. But economic profit is accounting profit minus implicit costs and explicit costs over here. Okay, so economic profit includes implicit costs, whereas accounting profit doesn't. I know I say this. I'm repeating myself, but it's a very important point because you will get different profits in most scenarios once you include implicit costs. And truly, when we make business decisions, we should look at implicit costs. What are we giving up to get something else? So if I'm going to quit my job, you know, let's say I made $200,000 teaching um, and I want to start my own business... I should be taking into consideration the amount of money that I would be giving up teaching in order to start my own business. This figure is just showing that economic profit includes implicit costs and explicit costs, and accounting profit only includes explicit costs. Again, explicit costs require a cash outlay. Implicit costs do not. Okay. So the difference between the short run and the long run is that in the short run, some inputs are variable. So, you know, what we pay for some of our mater materials and resources, you know, that can change in price. But the plant size in the short run is not variable. We don't have time to build a whole new plant to increase capacity. Whereas in the long run, all inputs are variable. Um, Firms can adjust their plant size, but they can also enter and exit the industry. So, you know, new firms can enter the industry and firms that aren't doing so well can exit the industry. Whereas in the short run, if a firm is not doing so well, then they can shut down, but they cannot exit. Um, normally, they are bound by a lease. And so they have to finish out their lease before they can exit. So in the short run, they can shut down, but they cannot no firms can enter or exit. Okay, these short-run production relationships help firms determine um, how much they can produce. 
And first, we look at total product, and that is the total output that they have produced of a good or a service. Marginal product is how much does total product change whenever you change a labor input. So if you hire one more worker, how much does total product change from hiring that extra worker? Average product measures productivity. Um, how much output does each labor input produce? Assuming that technology remains the same, each firm is subject to the law of diminishing return. Diminishing return has set in when marginal product starts to fall um, with additional units of input. So let's say worker three produces 10 lattes, worker four produces nine lattes. So you can see here that there's still worker three, excuse me, worker four has still produced lattes, but he's produced one less latte than worker three. And let's say worker five produces eight lattes, worker six produces seven lattes, etc. So marginal product is increasing, but at a decreasing rate. And marginal product can be negative, um, but Usually it's when, you know, in, as inputs increase, output increases, but at a diminishing rate. Each worker, each unit produces less and less than the one before. So let's say the variable resource here is labor. So with zero units of labor, you know, there's no product produced. Let's say the first worker produces 10 units. Okay, so change in marginal product here is 10. Okay, so as we added one worker, output increased by 10. Okay, let's see the second worker. Okay, with two workers, total output is 25. Okay, so marginal product here is total output changed by 15 when we added the second worker okay and then three workers produce 45 so the third worker added 20 units of output so we see here that marginal returns are increasing so first worker 10 second worker adds 15 third worker adds 20 now with four workers there's a total of 60 units produced Okay, and the marginal product of the fourth worker is 15, okay, which is less than the marginal product of the third worker. Okay, the fifth worker adds 10 units, the sixth, five, and then so on. And then here, um, the eighth worker would actually per, uh, ca cause a loss of five units. Okay, so we have diminishing marginal returns setting in here. And then here we have negative marginal returns. And we can see that first productivity is increased, and then it decreases as well. And this can happen because, let's say there's crowding. Let's say there's a fixed plot of land that needs to be farmed. And, you know, as we add more and more workers, first marginal product's increasing, but then let's say there's too many workers trying to cultivate the same plot of land and it, you know, they bump into each other, they're working, you know, elbow to elbow next to each other and they're not able to work as efficiently. So if, I don't know if you guys ever experienced this, but you might walk into a Starbucks and there's like seven workers, but yet it takes forever to get your coffee and your brownie and it's because it could just be overcrowding. There's too many people per machine and no one's really sure, you know, what they need to be doing next. Okay, and if we were to graph this out, you know, over here we have average product Okay, and then we have marginal product.
Okay. And so this is what total product will look like. So first it's increasing at an increasing rate and then it's increasing at a decreasing rate. We can see it as it starts to flatten. And then if negative marginal returns sit in, then actual total product would decrease. Okay, so in the short run, firms have fixed costs and variable costs. So fixed costs are costs that do not vary with output. So if you sign, let's say you're going to open up your own bakery and you sign a one-year lease um, with a small space to open your bakery, let's say you're paying $1,000 a month. So whether you, in the end, produce a cake or not, that cost is fixed. You have to pay it regardless of your output. Now, variable costs do vary with output. So the more cakes you produce, the higher your variable cost will be because you'll have to buy more flour, more sugar, more eggs, more butter, etc. And total cost is the sum of fixed costs and variable costs. So in the short one, we can see our total costs. Okay, and then our variable costs. Remember, variable costs vary with production. So the more we produce here, okay, on the horizontal axis, you could see units. So the more units we produce, the higher our variable costs will be. Okay, and then we have total fixed costs here at the horizontal line, okay, notice it does not vary with production. And that's what we said is that fixed costs do not vary with production. And then the difference between total cost and total variable cost is the amount of the fixed cost. Okay. Also, we have average costs. So average fixed costs would be total fixed costs divided by uh, the amount of units produced. Average variable cost would be average variable cost divided by the quantity produced. Average total cost, same thing, be total cost divided by um, total units produced. And marginal cost, okay, is the change in total cost that happens when you decide to produce an additional unit of output. So if I were to produce an extra cake, how much did my total cost change when I decided to produce that cake? Okay, so we can look at this graph here. All right, so if we produce zero units of output, our total fixed cost is 100. And notice here that total fixed cost does not vary with production. So it is 100 all the way through. But variable costs do vary with production. So the more we produce, Okay, the higher our variable costs will be. Total costs will be columns two and three added together. And then average fixed costs would be column two divided by uh, column one. So here, you know, average fixed cost for producing one unit is 100. For two units, it's 50 because this would be 100 divided by 2. 3 units would be 100 divided by 3, and then so on. Average variable cost, okay, would be column 3 divided by column 1, so 90 divided by 1 is 90, 170 divided by 2 is 85, and etc. Average total cost here, okay, would be column 4 divided by column 1, so 190, let me change colors here, okay, so be like, okay, we have total cost, 190 divided by 1 will give us average total cost here of 190, 270 divided by 2 will give us average total cost here of 135, and then so on, and we have marginal cost. Okay, so marginal cost is how much did total cost change 
when we produce an additional unit of output. Okay, so here we see and we decided to produce one unit of output. Okay, total cost went from 100 to 190, so the change in total cost was 90 when we decided to produce one additional unit. Okay, going from unit one to two, okay, total cost change from 190 to 270. Okay, so the difference in that was 80. And then we produced one additional unit. We went from one unit we just added on one unit. We went from one to two, so the difference here is one unit. Okay. Marginal cost of producing unit three. Okay. So total cost changed by 70, so 340 minus 270 gives us change with 70 divided by, again, we produced just one additional unit, so marginal cost is 70, etc. Okay, so because average fixed cost does not vary with production, it stays the same. The more we produce, the lower average fixed cost would be. Okay. Average variable cost does vary with production. And so a lot of times it's a U-shape that it starts to fall as we employ our resources, but then as you know, we increase production, we need more inputs and it starts to rise. And then average total cost, okay, starts up high, but as we produce more units, drops, and then eventually will start to rise again. And the difference between average total cost here and average variable cost is average fixed cost. And the next slide will show marginal costs included, but I'm just going to go ahead and include it in here. Okay, and what we find is marginal cost intersects average total cost at its lowest point. Okay. And this is because when marginal cost is below average total cost, average total cost falls. And then when marginal cost is greater than average total cost, then average total cost rises. And if the same is true for the average variable cost curve, marginal cost will intersect the average variable cost curve at its lowest point for the same reasons. Let's look at the relationship between productivity curves and cost curve. Okay, so we see here, let's draw marginal cost. And average variable cost. Okay, and then we have marginal product, and average product. Okay, and what we find is that marginal product peaks when marginal cost is at its lowest. So when marginal cost is falling, marginal product is rising. 
Okay, and then we also find that when average variable cost is falling, average product is rising, and then the peak of average product is when average variable cost is at its lowest, and then as average variable costs start to rise, average product will fall. Okay, let's look at an example using numbers with marginal costs and marginal product. We're going to use the same numbers that we use in the table a couple slides back. Okay, so let's say that each worker is hired for a hundred dollars. Okay, and so the first worker produces 10 units, so marginal product okay, will be the change in total product, which is 10, divided by the change in labor, which is one worker, so it's 10. Okay, marginal cost of these units, okay, so let's say the workers cost a hundred dollars, so hiring worker is a hundred, and this worker produces ten units, so the marginal cost per units here is also ten. Okay, now the marginal product of the second worker okay, is fifteen. And the marginal cost per unit, okay, second worker again is a hundred dollars, that's their wage, divided by fifteen is six point six seven. Okay. So we see here marginal product, first worker is ten, second worker it's fifteen, and so it's rising but the marginal cost between the first and second worker has decreased, okay? And it will do this, okay, until we get to the fourth worker, and what we see with the fourth worker is that marginal product starts to decline and marginal cost starts to rise. So let's look at the marginal cost and the marginal product starting with worker four, okay? So the fourth worker, Okay, adds a marginal product of 15, marginal cost okay, 6.67, okay, and then we have the fifth worker, and the fifth worker adds 10, units and the marginal cost per these units let's see okay is 10 so we see worker 4 the marginal cost per unit is 6.67 the marginal cost for the fifth worker is 10 so marginal cost is rising okay but the marginal product for worker 4 is excuse me, for worker five is lower than for worker four, so marginal product is decreasing. And that's what we see again here on this graph, okay, is that again as marginal product rises, okay, marginal cost falls, and then as marginal product starts to fall, okay, here we go, this marginal product here starts to fall, 
Okay, marginal cost rises. And we can do the same calculations as well for average product and average variable cost. In the long run, all costs are variable and firms can change their size. So if they're at full capacity in the short run with a small size, they could increase to a medium size um, or to a large size and then vice versa. If they have too much excess capacity, let's say they're a large plant and they have excess capacity and they don't need all those machines and they can downsize to a medium size plant instead of a large size plant. And the long run average total cost curve is the sum of a series of short run average total cost curves. Okay, so, so here we have average total cost curves from the short run of various plant sizes. So for example, average total cost curve three is from a plant that is bigger than from average total cost curve 2. Okay. And the long run average cost curve will look something like this. It shows unlimited plant size. Okay, last slide showed, you know, if the number of possible plants was about five, but if it's much longer than five, you know, you can have all these short run totals cost curve and underlying it could be the possibility here in the long run. The long run average total cost curve is smoother when there's a larger number of possible plant sizes than when it's shorter. So the last graph, it was a little choppier here. We have um, a higher possible number of plant sizes and it shows a smoother long run average total cost curve. Okay, so when we're looking at, again, The long run average total cost curve. Okay, this is output. This is average total cost. Okay. All right, so the first part of the curve where average total cost is declining with output is what we call economies of scale. And economies of scale is when average total costs decline with increasing output. And there's a few reasons um, why economies of scale takes effect. The first one is labor specialization. And so as a plant increases in size, then the plant can hire workers that can specialize in a specific job. And that usually increases overall production versus if it was a one-man operation and that one person had to do a little bit of everything, um, they wouldn't be as efficient in getting things done. Also managerial specialization, you know, as plants increase in size, then managers can specifically manage their area instead of handling multiple areas at once. And then larger plants can afford more efficient uh, capital goods, they're able to buy these, the more expensive goods and spread out the cost over higher levels of production. And also, uh, you know, if the firm does well, uh, you know, it can help spread out high costs in the beginning, from the beginning, such as startup costs, spread out the cost of advertising with increased production, etc. And then we see here that after a certain point, increased output leads to higher average total cost, and this is called diseconomies of scale, which we'll discuss more in the next slide. And I want to point that right here where it's flat, this would be constant 
returns to scale, and this is when average total cost does not change with output. Okay, so this economies of scale can occur for a number of reasons. Um, if the firm or the plant expands rapidly in a short period of time, there can be a lot of control and coordination problems along with communication problems which can, which can lead to worker alienation. There may not be enough managers and hiring more managers to manage the managers, to help manage the people under them, um, can be very costly. And because of the different levels here, like I said earlier, it leads to worker alienation and they might start blowing off their responsibilities because they feel like a little guy that's unheard in a large scale operation with many employees. In the next few chapters, we're gonna look at market structure and minimum efficient scale can help determine what market structure we're in. Minimum efficient scale is simply the lowest level of output at which a firm uh, minimizes their long run average costs. So for a natural monopoly, the costs are minimized when a f one firm produces a product. So it could be in a small town and let's say an electric company operates more efficiently when they can service 10,000 houses. Their average total cost is minimized by servicing 10,000 houses. Um, but if there were two firms servicing the houses, then average total cost would be higher because the economies of scale are not fully re uh, realized here. So the government sometimes grants natural monopolies in certain areas because costs are minimized when it's just one firm servicing everyone and that will benefit the customer. Of course, they are regulated to make sure they are um, actually charging the customer fair prices. So for economies of scale, average total cost is decreasing as output increases, constant returns to scale, average total cost is not changed with output, and then this economies of scale, average total cost increases with um, additional output. So we can see here economies of scale was rapidly attained and this economies of scale was not realized until output was increased at a significant point. Okay, in this market structure, economies of scale is realized for quite a bit of output and it's this economies of scale is realized only after output has reached a very large level and in this structure economies of scale is reached very quickly and then this economies of scale is realized uh, quite immediately and so minimum Average total cost occurs at a lower level of output than in the last two examples. All right, so rising gasoline prices, um, and depending on how much of an input gasoline was to begin with, um, increases average variable cost, marginal cost, and average total cost curves. So this can quickly lead to a company to realize this economies of scale. Okay, so startup firms can have high costs. Um, however, um, they reduce their costs by increasing production and then in the long run by increasing uh, the firm size so that way they can realize economies of scale. You know, and they do this by increasing um, labor, having labor being specialized hiring management and acquiring better equipment. Okay, the Vincent stamping machine is a machine that cuts and sculpts raw sheets of steel into automobile parts, such as hoods and fenders. And it allows uh, new parts to be made in just five minutes in some 
cases, whereas before for older machines, it was about, you know, eight hours. And so the more cars the firm can make, then the more economies of scale they will realize because this machine is about $30 million. And so if they were to only make one car with this machine, okay, that's a very high cost per car. But if they were to make a million cars, or rather, let's say 300 million cars with this machine, then the cost of the machine will be spread out per unit and it will decrease per unit produced, therefore realizing economies of scale. Newspapers, this is an industry that has been experiencing diseconomies of scale. So readership has declined. You know, we get a lot of our news now on the Internet. So, you know, demand for print newspapers has been declining. And so this increases their average fixed cost because they had to be spread over less and less newspapers. So they've had to decrease their costs, but when they decrease their costs, then their average fixed cost, again, um, goes up because now the, the revenue they're making from the newspapers divided by their average fixed cost um, is less. The aircraft industry is an example um, of an industry where economies of scale are extensive and diseconomies of scale are only realized at very high levels of output. Assembling an aircraft takes a lot of labor and a lot of expensive equipment. So, you know, average total cost will decline at higher outputs and this economies of scale would only occur at extremely, extremely high levels of output. Whereas a concrete plant that, that produces ready made, already mixed concrete, okay, they realize their economies of scale at a lower um, output because their inputs are not so high. It requires some workers and inexpensive equipment so their total cost is not as high, for example, as the aircraft industry and economies of scale are realized much faster and exhausted at a lower level of output. Okay, so the first industrial revolution began when we had steam-powered engines, and so they could drive factory equipment, propel ships, and they're used in locomotives. Factories were automated, and so low-cost mass production of consumer goods was able to begin, and it led to consumer goods being much more affordable. The second industrial revolution occurred when electricity was harnessed to be able to drive factories and also provide lighting. Economies of scale took a bit longer to be realized than in the first industrial revolution because this also required large distributive networks, larger advertising budgets, and also um, a way to ship products that were not too expensive. So this provided an incentive for transportation to be improved. And the third industrial revolution is, they say it's beginning now with the 3D printer and so you know you need let's say a spoon if you have the printer you can make a spoon with the 3D printer right in your own home I know San Jack has a 3D printer if you want to go see it and test it out they will let you and the thing about this 3D printer is that it's not very expensive so you know we could all own one in our own home or in our office and you know if we need something right away made, you know, we can program it to make that good. So as the technology keeps improving, 3D printers will be become cheaper and cheaper and the and the goods that they will be able to make will become more and more complex. Okay, so this concludes chapter nine.